two speakers for our next segment uh, from either side of the US. Uh, you've already met Karen from earlier in the week, hopefully you were here. And we have Bradley as well, who's from the other side of the continent. And their talk today is entitled Open Source One, but Software Freedom Hasn't Yet, a guide and commiseration session for FOSS activists. Please welcome Bradley and Karen. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Sandler. And I'm Bradley Kuhn. And this is Linux Conf Australia. So, uh, so, we're, so we're glad to be at this conference. I know it's probably not the case, you don't realize this, uh, those of you that, that live here in Australia or generally on this side of the Pacific, uh, but this conference is much different than a conference this size would be in the United States. Uh, there are many conferences very similar to this one that are regional, smaller events in the United States, uh, but the larger events are primarily controlled by companies. Uh, they wouldn't accept a talk like this uh, at most of those conferences because they're focused on the corporate side of open source. Uh, and this conference is a very large community conference, which is rare. I think FOSM is the only other conference that's comparable. I have to tell you that the topic of this talk is a somewhat depressing topic, but I am so inspired and moved and having such a good time at this conference that I'm in an amazing mood. <laughs> so, I, it's a, <laughs> you clap for yourself because this is, uh, it really is an amazing conference and I think that what's, uh, what's so incredible is that, uh, is that where I think at a lot of other conferences and in a lot of other communities, I think um, folks have either embraced their corporate jobs and stopped thinking about the ideals of free and open source software, or they have sort of clung on to their old ways of thinking. And I think that here the community is totally different. I feel like the community managed to mature while still holding on to its ideals. And so I like, and the issues that the ordinary person at this conference understands are so much more complex and interesting than at other, those other conferences that we talked about. And so this talk is actually for those, those of all of you and all of us who have been thinking about these issues in software freedom and how they impact our, our lives in, in every day and about software freedom activism. So we're lucky to work for an organization that is a charity rather than a company. So we have the privilege and uh, the ability to spend a lot of time thinking about the question of whether or not we're living in the type of culture we want to with regard to technology and what has gone wrong with regard to basically the adoption of open source uh, at often the expense of software freedom. Yep, and I would say, just to put the Conservancy logo back, that part of the reason why I'm in such a good mood is that all of you donated and you helped us meet our fundraising goal for the end of the year, and thank you so much. That's incredible, you support Conservancy, so thank you. Okay, so we try, we've tried to be purists. Raise your hand if you, like us, have spent big portions of your life trying to avoid as much proprietary software as possible. It's like three quarters of the audience. Yeah, at, at a, at a um, larger corporate event that would not be, there would not be very many people in the audience who raised their hands, so thank you. Uh, the difficulty with that is that it's become more and more difficult uh, over time, uh, over recent time, to focus and use only free software. There was kind of a moment in the mid to late 2000s, uh, kind of before the deployment of applications on web platforms became a standard way the companies deployed applications, you could actually do pretty much any computing task you could imagine with only free software. Uh, it was right around that moment that people uh, in here probably do remember this, that in 2006, the 2006 started, uh, there was only one serial ATA card on the market that supported, was supported in Linux. By the end of 2006, there was only one serial ATA card on the market that didn't support Linux. It was this moment when everything kind of changed and, and at least the server market was completely Linux based uh, and we had the opportunity to use only free software. <clears throat> So one of the things that we've tried to do in, in free software is provide a certain amount of, of moral leadership. And by that, I mean, not, we don't mean it as a heavy handed sort of thing. We've made the effort to carefully make moral decisions about software freedom. 
what is really the, the issue of right and wrong uh, with regard to free software. Uh, and so uh, Karen and I both uh, watched this television show, which actually spent an entire uh, season uh, mostly in Australia. Uh, and this is a character named Chidi, who is a moral philosopher right, by So, so the, the, the yeah. show is The Good Place. And just so we know, like, raise your hand if you've seen at least one episode of The Good Place. So it's like don't a, worry, there's it's no like spoilers a, a quarter talk. of the audience. I yeah. just wanted to. <laughs> and there's no spoilers in this talk, so don't worry if you have not. Um, but it's the first television show ever to actually um, really grapple with the question of morality. It's certainly the first time I've heard names of moral philosophers on television uh, you know, the, that I studied when I was an undergraduate in university. And uh, Chidi is this uh, moral philosopher, uh, a PhD and, and a university professor, um, who spends his entire life rather obsessed with the moral implications, even the smallest decision. And here we see him deciding which type of muffin to buy for breakfast uh, and considering all the various different issues of how the various ingredients were sourced and whether they were negative impact on climate change and all sorts of things and what kind of waste there's going to be and that when, he, when he gets the, the muffin wrapper uh, and all those sorts of questions. Uh, and, and this is the kind of way that we've looked at free software. And now it can sometimes be very paralyzing uh, to look at a software question at this level of detail. Um, but I think one of the interesting things is that, is that to be a moral philosopher, you have to spend a lot of time. And actually, the, the history of moral philosophy is people having, it really kind of begins with people begin to have leisure time uh, to sit back and look at these kinds of questions. Yeah, and I think like the, the muffin analogy is a really good one because it, the character seems insufferable, right? He can't decide something as basic as what kind of muffin he's going to have for breakfast. But, um, but what that choice reveals is that it's complicated, right? And the choices that we're making are, a lot of the issues are invisible to you when you're just making the decision if you're a casual observer. You have to dig deeper to find these issues. And in fact, there are issues related to which muffin you buy, just as there are issues in, to what technology you buy, what phone you buy. But for most people, those issues are, are not ones that they see every day. And so when we look at the history of moral philosophy in free software, um, it's been heavily influenced by Immanuel Kant and uh, a really traditional categorical imperative analysis. And certainly, I came to free software um, you know, deeply believing in a Kantian ethical system. Uh, I was, as an undergraduate, very much a modernist. I, I remember when, I, when, I, uh, when the professor came in, this is the mid-90s, in, in my modernism, you know, cultural modernism class. Uh, you know, after the first week, he said, he said well, you're, some of you aren't getting this because you're all post-structuralists, except for Bradley, he's a complete mo a modernist. Um, so, you know, and I was the only one who thought Hegel like, made any sense. So, so, so this was all very normal to me. Uh, what I've realized in recent years is that the, the level to which the proscriptive moral philosophy has been pushed onto people um, is, uh, is somewhat aggressive in free software. And Karen and I both have spent a lot of time discussing and thinking about how do we make the approach to what is right and wrong in software freedom less of a, a, a kind of categorical more imperative that is handed down to people uh, and just basically makes people feel bad for having to make extremely difficult choices, even if they seem like they're simple choices. Yep. And Bradley studied moral philosophy. I was just an engineer. So for me, I'm sort of get at it a little bit more practically. And I'm sort of like, well, how do we bring a context to these important issues that we know that we're grappling with, but we don't necessarily have the vocabulary? And I would say that, um, and maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit to say this here, but we've had like a little bit of crisis in terms of what is the direction of our movement? What is our movement? Who is our movement? You know, we've had all of these questions over the, 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 the last decade, but especially the last year, and it's, it's coming to a head. And so we have to address these issues straight on and figure out a way to not just talk about our issues, but also to think about them. So I promise this is the last uh, good place slide, but, th but here the characters are considering uh, the, the classic uh, philosophy problem called the, the trolley problem, where you have to decide between uh, having the trolley, uh, which is out of control, uh, run over, um, you know, you know, injure five people versus kill one, and how do you make that kind of decision? Uh, and it does it matter if you know who they are and all those sorts of things? Uh, of course, it's a classic philosophy problem because it involves life or death. 
And the issues when life, life and death are on the line are very different uh, than when they're not. Uh, but on the other hand, it, there is kind of a morality in everything. So I think about this television show itself. Uh, I have the, I don't have the trolley problem with regard to television, but I have the muffin problem with regard to television because I have two choices to watch episodes of The Good Place. I can use a DRM-based system and therefore use de facto proprietary software to watch it, or I can torrent the files and infringe copyright to watch both of which uh, are morally ambiguous and moral problematic things to do, uh, but the choices are pretty abysmal. Yeah, I actually have the trolley problem a little bit in my life because I have a pacemaker defibrillator, I can't see the source code in my own body, and I have uh, technology that's presented to me as, you know, do you want this life-saving device or not? Right? So I have to take the defibrillator, but having the defibrillator caused me to have unnecessary treatment delivered um, when, my, um, uh, when my situation was different than that had been anticipated by the manufacturers um, when I was shocked unnecessarily when I was pregnant. And so arguably at this point, I have, at this point in my life, I've had this defibrillator for a whole lot of years now and I've never actually needed it but it has actually harmed me, but I'm not sure which way is better because at any moment I might suddenly die, or I might, and it's this question of do I have the device or not, and uh, you know, I, I think that I like talking about my heart condition even though I hate talking about having a heart condition because it brings these issues down to a life or death situation, but generally it's gonna be a metaphor and we're not always looking at life or death situations. And there's a, a moment of attrition where we've reached a time in the history of software where it's in the normal course of daily life uh, that 2006 uh, utopia, which it seems like now, 2006 really seems like a utopia to me now, given the world I live in today, um, it, it, the, there's very little you can do with a computer without using proprietary software. Um, so this is the page that you see. Uh, this was a screenshot uh, during FOSDEM uh, last year. No, um, oh no, you updated. Uh, Karen updated. So it's still true. It was uh, I, I used to have I used to have Dutch on it uh, on the previous version of this slide. Um, but this is the uh, page that you get if you try to look at Google Maps without JavaScript turned on in your browser. Uh, and most people don't realize, uh, I think probably most people in this room do, but most people in the general world don't realize that what the web has become is a very efficient means of installing lots of proprietary software on your computer very, very quickly. Because every time you visit a website, it downloads a program and installs it on your computer and runs it in the browser in the JavaScript engine. And if you choose not to do that, you don't really experience what most people would call the web you hit things like this, which is just unbelievably mean <laughs> um, to tell somebody, well, you know, your browser doesn't support JavaScript, so you're, you're empty without it uh, if you don't install proprietary software. Uh, so it's, it's, it, th this is the kind of moral decision you make. Of course, if you want to get somewhere or figure out what the map is, you can use Google Maps and install a proprietary JavaScript. You can use OpenStreetMap, which doesn't have the same feature set. And it's, it's, it, these are tough moral dilemma questions that I think everybody who cares about software freedom faces now. Yeah, and we, well, just go back a little bit, and okay. we're, we're, we're a little bit alone because the same thing, it's, it, it's, it's invisible to most people. They don't see that they're proprietary JavaScript. They have no idea what proprietary JavaScript is. Their web pages just work for them. They don't think they're installing any software, right? Like this, this is, this is, this is the, the, the whole thing. It's the same thing with the defibrillator. Most people who get their medical devices don't even have a chance to think about it. And that software, as it's applied, in, um, in all kinds of critical technology has the same impact on other people. And it's, it's, it's all totally invisible to most people. And the only time they see it are when there are catastrophic failures. And so we are left, as a community, we're tasked with this job of knowing that all of this is happening and trying to explain it to people who haven't even seen that the problem exists. And so one of the things we want to point out is that it, it wasn't just the web that caused this problem to be acute. So this machine, uh, the, the last series of uh, the X200 and T500 ThinkPads, uh, many of you, if, if, you uh, if you noticed my first talk, there was trouble on Monday uh, with getting the display working. It's because I still carry uh, in my bag a 
2000, what, I guess 10 era laptop uh, because it can run 100% free software. And so not only did we see the web become a proprietary software delivery device, the nature of how hardware is constructed changed. And we ended up with not just one computer in a laptop, but dozens of computers, most of which are not running Linux, they're running a proprietary firmware uh, that Linux talks to. And so from the BIOS to the firmware on the wireless card to the firmware in the Bluetooth stack to the firmware in the uh, almost every peripheral, uh, there is a proprietary software program. And we're getting to this moment where it's harder and harder to run yeah. uh, a free software device, even if you don't connect to the web. Yeah, raise your hand if you still have one of these old devices and are using it. I see some in the audience, so there's, yeah, there's like five or six people who raised their hand. And you already covered, I already covered, covered my the, the hard device. Yeah. Um, and so Karen and I, we used this particular. But if you go back, that is actually a picture of my, uh, of my old defibrillator that was in my body, and the dent was probably from when they were prying it out. So I think it's kind of cool. And so, <laughs> So, so Karen and I use this particular uh, telephone for basically as long as it, it, it's, it's, uh, its network life. Um, because this, this was, uh, uh, it's called the HTC Dream was the model name, and it was kind of the dream of free software in mobile. Uh, it admittedly had a proprietary firmware on the uh, baseband, uh, which is a difficult challenge uh, with regard to regulatory bodies um, for over-the-air uh, communications. But every other piece of software on this device uh, was free software. And we were able to use it as a phone and as a internet browser and for text messages for basically 10 years. Yeah, and what I loved about it was that we were like kind of ahead of the curve in a way, or like they're like not not everyone had smartphones at the time, and so we had this cool little piece of kit that that we would use, and uh, people who knew us would say, "Oh yeah, you're tech people, and you like your you know you like your toys," and I felt very like it was like a real like joining of of my work and identity, and uh, and it was it was it was really nice for a while, and then we kept using these phones and using these phones, and using these phones, and there wasn't much to upgrade to that, uh, that gave us the same level of freedom. And we kept using the phones. And then all of you who had those old phones kept sending them to us so that when our phones broke, we had more phones. I have like a stack of like 10 of these in my house that, you know, just, just in case I have to go back. Well, um, and, and the problem, one of the problems is, and, the, and this is somewhat of a side point to free software, but that one piece of proprietary, it's not really a side point actually, the one piece of proprietary software on it um, actually is what killed the device. So in the United States, when they uh, issued these uh, G1 phones, the HTC Dream, uh, they were on a band that is no longer supported for 3G in the United States. And not only that, they're now deprecating 3G throughout the US. Um, I now carry a Nexus One, which was the next generation, which had a more proprietary software, but less than the generation after it. So it was you know, one step in the wrong direction, but only one step, not three. Uh, but that phone works great here, by the way, because you still support 3G in Australia. But when at home, depending on the, which city it is, I have a lot of trouble in the United States because they're deprecating 3G throughout. And I, it's interesting because that links up to a lot of other ethical issues about the waste stream and a perfectly good device. These HTC Dreams would still work if the network supported the, the bands that they're trying to use. Yeah, and at the same time, manufacturers started to treat these devices as much more disposable. Raise your hand if you have gotten a new phone in the last year. It's like uh, almost half of the audience, which is actually lower than I would expect. Uh, but we treat these devices as, uh, as disposable, and the manufacturers expect them to be disposable. And so the idea of replacing and improving the software is not um, not designed in, but we're still, if you're trying to control your own technology and replacing your software, you are constantly chasing the end of life problem where these devices change and you have done the reverse engineering work and the development work and now you have a very old device that is simply not supported. So some of this is certainly like a, 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 a tech person's only problem. Some of it is more very much the, you know, which muffin are you going to pick? Is it really gonna make that much of a difference? But one of the strange things that's happened is that technology has become such an intricate part of companies' abilities to collect data on you. So we ended up with a collision of the proprietary software problem with the privacy and data collection problem in ways that are pretty disturbing. And instead of using the 
obvious example, which Facebook, and we could talk about what happened in our US election with regard to Facebook, but this is a problem that affects the daily lives of people a lot more. I don't know how common this is in Australia. This is a photo, admittedly, from the US, but at this point, it is hard to get coupons uh, or coupons uh, to work if you don't have a proprietary digital device with a proprietary app that does data tracking on you uh, to get discounts at the grocery store. Um, and having grown up in a, in a lower middle class family, I, I never had any food insecurity. I always tell people, well, there was never seconds. Like I got enough food, but I always wanted seconds, which is why it's really hard for me to turn away seconds uh, my entire life. Um, but so I was raised to find the coupons, find the cheapest thing you could get, you know, get, get as many of the coupons as you can. So I use these proprietary apps and get the digital deals because they're much cheaper. Of course, the trade-off I have to make is not only running proprietary software, which bothers me enough, but also now the grocery store can track my purchases so completely in a way that is, makes the old, day of just, old days of just using a regular kind of like scan card uh, seem like, like, like child's version of, of data collection. As a Karen, sometimes I go into the grocery store and I ask them, if they can give me the coupon, even though I don't have a coupon because I don't sign up for these schemes. Um, and sometimes they do give them to me, even if the coupon's expired. <laughs> no, but I, actually, sometimes you can I, I ask tried that once as a Bradley, and they told me I just wasn't using the app correctly. Um, so. Yeah, sometimes they'll, anyway. <laughs> but, but yeah. So, um, and you've experienced, I think, in your life, um, similar types of, of problems yeah, yeah, and I talked about this at, uh, at this conference last year, so I'm not going to uh, go too deep into it, but, uh, but the proprietary software and its insidiousness is pervasive into every part of our lives and places you really don't expect. And so I went with my family on a trip to Disneyland, which is fraught with all kinds of problems in all different ways, but, um, but it was a, a big deal for my kids to go there, and I was so excited. We saved up money to go. Um, and when I got there, I realized that built into my ticket was the ability to cut the line effectively um, a certain number of times. And the only way that you could use that functionality was if you installed the, the Disneyland app on your phone. And, um, and of course, I don't have a phone. That I'm not going to install proprietary software anyway, but it would, be, uh, it would take effort to, to, to do it. I certainly wasn't going to be able to do it on the spot, even if I wanted to. Um, and my husband, who uh, sometimes does install proprietary software on his phone, or sells more, more proprietary software on his phone, had an old phone, and so the app just simply couldn't work. And, uh, and we realized with this sinking feeling that we were going to have to be the ones who, you know, who wait on the line while the, the people who can afford new phones like whisked past us, and how sad was that? And I remembered, wait, I'm, I'm a software freedom activist. I can, I can go talk to people about this. And so I went to customer service and talked to them about it. And uh, I didn't ask to see the manager, but uh, but they were very nice, and they what they were horrified when they realized that what had happened. And I realized that if you know that that people who can't afford new phones are likely very embarrassed to admit that they can't afford a new phone, they're not going to go to the customer service people and say, you know, actually, I, you know, I saved up money to come here, and I, I don't have the same toys that other people have. I don't have the, the same luxuries. They're going to just wait on the line and, you know, and not draw attention to themselves um, often. And, and, and it's the folks who are, um, it's the folks that, that have less, who are, are, are desperately impacted by these kinds of policies. And what is amazing about it is it shows that these decisions are, are baked into the technology at a fundamental level, and that our use of technology is, um, is increasing the uh, class separations that we already have. So we talked about how uh we don't think anymore that a prescriptive nature, uh, we're, we're, not, we're, we're standing up here admitting various different proprietary software things that we use as a way of pointing out that this is not an easy solution. Like, I, 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 I was raised to get coupons, and I'm not going to stop using coupons no matter how much proprietary software I have to install. Um, so I ended up with this really horrible concept that, that I mainly want to tell as a cautionary tale. So uh, my father, uh, my mother died a few years ago, and my father, uh, turns out he was, uh, spoiler, he was going to get remarried, um, and he lives on the east coast of the U.S. I live on the west coast of the U.S. now. And so he wanted to Is tell me. Long after the 
Yeah. 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 Years after, but but it's been a couple of years. To be clear. Um, but uh, but so he but he wanted to tell me. So it was you know it had been a couple of years, and he wanted to tell me obviously. So the way he did this because he wasn't going to make me fly to the East Coast so he could tell me. So I open uh, you know I, I, the 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 post uh, person shows up one day, and then this is in a a box. This tablet, and I'm like, my father knows about. My father's a programmer, right? So he has heard lots about free software from me. So why he sent me a proprietary tablet, he knows. He wasn't supposed to do that, um, but it turns out that he wanted to use Google Hangouts so that he could tell me in video chat. Um, and he was not aware that there was any free software video chat. And in fact, using WebRTC while it works is not as easy to set up as, as Google Hangouts. Um, and so then I had this thing, right? So he, so he calls me, he introduces me to, to the woman he's going to marry, and then he proceeded never to call me again on the thing, uh, which is fine, because uh, I'm happy to just talk to him on the phone instead. But then I had this device, right? And so you know, he bought it. So from my point of view, he agreed to the licenses. I, I, did, I was careful not to agree to any licenses when I booted it up. So from my point of view, I haven't agreed. That Karen's, Karen is a lawyer shaking her head that this, there is absolutely no legal defense. But as a moral defense, I feel this is justified. <laughs> so uh, I decided when I ran into the problem of getting the grocery store sales and everything, well, I'll just use this as my proprietary dumping ground, right? I'll just start, anytime I encounter an Android app that's proprietary that I, uh, like it would be more convenient to use, I'll put it on that. Now, this is actually the absolute worst approach you can have when you're trying to avoid proprietary software, because now I have a perfectly coherently set up single tracking device that has all of these apps talking to each other very easily. So Google Maps on there can talk to my grocery store app, can talk to every other app that I've installed to find out all sorts of different things about what is happening. And of course, you know, I can install the DRM-based uh, TV stuff on there, which now can talk to the grocery store app and everything else. So while it seems like, and I, I meet a lot of free software people but who say- But isn't it convenient, Bradley? It is very convenient, right? Um, and you know, it, it, is, it is one of these things where it, it, the convenience is so, so alluring and so dangerous. And I meet a lot of free software people who say this. Well, I have, one, I have one, one box or one whatever that I put all the proprietary stuff on. I'm actually kind of convinced if you're, when you have to use proprietary software, like dribble it around different devices so the various like, tracking things can't all talk to each other as easily. Uh, it might actually work a little bit better to help with the privacy issue. Yeah, I mean, I try to I, I try to really limit those those uses and then uninstall them. But I am so unpopular with my family, like I am I am I am the really annoying person, and I get lost all the time. Less so since OpenStreetMaps has gotten better, but like I I still and I, and, I, and I try to avoid the um, uh, proprietary GPS drivers. So I'm basically just looking at maps on my phone, uh, which is way better than uh, the paper map in, a rain, in the rain. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, so I, I, you know, I, no matter which way you go, it's no win. The, the one thing is, is that at least being safely out about this, like last year I had this in Christchurch as well, and people might have seen me qu quickly close something when they walked up. Now, at least people know I'm using a proprietary tablet that my dad sent me, so I don't have to like, hide it as much, which is kind of a central point that, that we really want to get across, that we both think, both Karen and I very strongly, that the traditional attitude of you are doing something wrong by using proprietary software needs to end today, here, and now. Do not criticize people for using proprietary software. It's a tough thing to applaud, right? It's, uh, but you it's know, right. It's, it's right because it shifts the, it, it's, it's, it's a wrong placing of the burden when you criticize users. The fact of the matter is that you cannot live in the world today. You cannot do basic things for yourself without spending a ton of time, right? That, that is, it would be unusual to you. So you can't book a flight. You can't, you know, interact with your bank. You can't do all kinds of very like essential things in your life without using some proprietary software. And you know, I, I think anyone who suggests that you could live a completely pure life just you know, isn't really living, isn't really doing things for themselves or isn't really living in the world. And it's, it's aspirational, but instead of treating it as aspirational, we attached some kind of virtuousness 
to not using proprietary software and some kind of uh, shame that comes out of using proprietary software because somehow we weren't strong enough to hold to our ideals. But the truth is that what we need to do is we need to, we need to end that criticism, but we need to continue to be extremely thoughtful with every decision we make when we're using proprietary software and when we're not. Just because we use it once doesn't mean that now we use it always forever, right? We reevaluate, we think about it, and we think about whether it needs to be continuous or whether we can just do it just for the moment. Indeed, and, and I, I, I was talking to a longtime free software activist, and I think there's a, a really important privilege issue to think about with regards to this. Um, I was trying to convince this person that, well, if you're just graduating college today, uh, graduating university, undergraduate, uh, and you want to get a job, you're basically going to have to create a LinkedIn account, which is all proprietary JavaScript, uh, because you're not going to be able to enter the workforce. And this person looks at me and says, well, you could get a job without using LinkedIn. I said, yes, because I've been working in the field for 20 years. But if I were just out of university, telling someone just out of university, don't use LinkedIn. It's a proprietary you know, privacy violating app uh, and website is just telling them, don't start your career. And so I think those people who have constantly said, oh, you can get along without, not using, without using proprietary software are in a position of privilege where they can. In fact, we know some activists who will try to get other people to use proprietary software on their behalf, which I think is actually much worse. Walking up to somebody and saying, will you use this proprietary software so I don't have to? If you think and morally feel that proprietary software is harmful, you're asking somebody else to do harmful. Uh, I'm also a vegetarian. I can't imagine walking up to somebody and encouraging them to eat meats. Like, like that would be, a, I, I mean, I don't get upset at people if they want to eat meat, but I wouldn't walk up to somebody and say, please eat meat. Uh, that's what it's like to tell somebody, please use proprietary software. <laughs> Oh, Keith's just giving me permission to tell him to please eat meat anytime I want, but <laughs> that's a special case. <laughs> Go ahead, Karen. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I think that, uh, that it's, it, we at, at Conservancy in particular have really evaluated this issue because we, wanted to, we, we want Conservancy to be a place where we can work free of proprietary software, right? We've been trying to avoid proprietary software. We're software freedom activists. This is our life, right? So we want to set up a work environment where we can avoid proprietary software as much as possible. But what we found is that often we have the choice of either we use the proprietary software in our systems or we force our like the people we volunteers. partner with, our volunteers or, you know, our outreachy interns or our donors or you know we, we, we constantly have these these decisions to make and what we decided that at Conservancy is that we are an organization designed to support the cause of software freedom and therefore when there's a choice we should take on the proprietary software use so that other people who are interacting with us don't have to it's sad we have to make this choice so often but we do and that means that we can't have a pure software freedom like a, a pure organization internally and I, I you know i i think that's okay because when you ask someone to use proprietary software for you it's like you're doing it yourself yeah. Oh, so check out my laptop. Uh, this is why. We, this is why we're there's no Mac up here because we're using Karen's laptop instead yeah. of mine to present. Right. And and so this is one of the so so I'm all you know virtuous on my high horse. I don't have a proprietary tablet. Please, Bradley. Right. Like you know I've, I've I in some ways I've avoided using um, proprietary software when other software freedom activists haven't. But. I, you know, at, at, at the end of the day, I, I caved on the laptop choice, and that is proprietary software. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's running Debian. It's, you know, it's, I think Jake referred to it as 98% free. That was my friend. Oh, that was Jake you? Jake picked up, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Bradley referred to it as 98% free. It's got a lot of good choices in it, but it, using it necessitates using proprietary software. Um, so it's, it's. It's generally good, but I, I made that, that call, and now my shoulder doesn't hurt as much when I walk around, and um, you know, and and, it, and I don't have as many issues with projectors, and you know. So we, we already talked about the, the issue with the phones. The, the interesting thing that we've seen, uh, and we've we've uh, I, well, I tried to dub this the Coon Sandler paradox, um, but uh, I think it's a bad idea to name anything after yourself. Uh, I, I don't mind it so much. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it, it, the interesting thing is the, the, we're in this weird moment in history where I'm pretty sure that every day there is more 
FOSS code. There are more lines of free software than existed the day before. Open source is one. Right, and that's, and that's what causes um, open source initiatives to, 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 to argue that, not, not the open source initiative, but open, other open source organizations argue that. Um, but the fact is, is there's less software freedom now than there was in 2006, because of course, the, the, the obvious reason this paradox exists is because the amount of software that people use in, the in their daily lives has increased so much. And if you live in the industrialized world, so many things are computerized that were not computerized uh, 15 years ago that we're, we're facing this paradox and the other reason I think that we face this paradox is the types of free software that's getting written is being dictated more by what companies want to use so we have Matthew Garrett if he's in the room had this great post uh, on a, a Linux list a couple of years ago where he pointed out that the types of technologies that are getting put into Linux are thing after thing that big giant data centers want uh, and there's fewer and fewer things being put in that are geared towards people who want to do things with IOT devices and smaller things that people actually have in their homes so when when you push the free software development more into serving corporate interests, individual users, I think, have fewer choices uh, at their end when they get an electronics device, particularly smaller electronics devices. Yeah, we're still, while there's maybe a lot more source code out there, you can't actually change the software on any of the devices you own, which means that if you're being surveilled or if your devices are doing things that you don't expect them to, you are powerless. You basically have to buy a new device. Um, and it means that we as a community can't go about taking control of all of those devices that we rely on. Right. So we, we, we don't want to, to dictate, as we said, uh, we don't know which type of muffin you ought to buy for sure. Uh, we want to talk more about how we as a community together can make the right choices to do better at this together. So think about it, as I said, you know, don't take it for granted. Ask questions at every stage of the, the game. Don't, don't it's so easy to feel overwhelmed by how little success we have had as a movement. <laughs> uh, even just saying those words just like hurts my heart a little bit. Um, but that's not a reason to give it up entirely. And I, I, I think one of the things that is really important is to try when you can to use free software. Um, so, so Karen and I did a, a, a strange thing last night. We ended up uh, staying up until 3 and 5 a.m. respectively, uh, Karen staying up later than me, to file our annual paperwork uh, with the tax authority in the U.S. for our organization. One of the reasons we had to do that is because if you want to file it electronically, you have to use proprietary software in the U.S., so we file it on paper. So we were filling out the fillable PDFs using free software software uh, so that our colleague Brett could print them and take them to the post office. Um, so we're both pretty tired today, and that's, uh, that's a small choice that we made that we think was worth it. Uh, the main reason we think that's worth it is because we want to signal to the U.S. tax authority that it's unreasonable that you have to use proprietary software. We know it's harder for them to deal with paper as well, but if they're, if they're giving us the choice as proprietary software or paper, we're going to keep picking paper until they give us a choice that's free software. And every time you make a small choice for software freedom, like, you should absolutely celebrate. It is not about all of our failures. You should say, you should pat yourself on the back and say, great, and then I'll do another one. I'll do another one as soon as I can, <laughs> you know? Um, and don't stop talking about the problem. Just because people say to you, oh, well, how much do you, I know you care about software freedom, but what about that device? What about you're doing here? What if you're doing here? It's totally unreasonable to ask me to use only free software. That's, it's not a reason to give up um, explaining why. We, never have we had a situation where the, um, the general media has, is, is basically so primed for us to talk about ethics and technology. Um, and people, ordinary people are understanding that there's something important going on with these devices and that there's a, a potential dark side to it and that by having control over their devices, there's something virtuous that can come from it. And I, I think it's really important that uh, not only do we not shame other people who are using proprietary software, uh, because they're the ones being harmed by this bad technology and we should have sympathy for them and help them find a solution that's not proprietary, but I don't think folks should shame themselves about it. I mean, I certainly have lived through a lot of shame and fear of people saying, well, I'm a free software activist, like if, if, I, if, I, if I can't, 
give the exact litany of the very few places where I have proprietary software I won't be taking seriously as a free software activist. Um, and that comes from a place of shame, of fear that, that, that I can't live this perfect example. I think it's much more important to tell people it's impossible to live a perfect example in our society, and that's one of the reasons we need to write a lot more free software and write a lot less proprietary software so that we can get to a point where you don't find yourself in those traps. And as I said, don't let the fact that these problems are big overwhelm you because we are a powerful community. We are a lot of smart people who care about the fate of our technology. And we have already accomplished a lot. So we, we, we can do a lot more together. And I think uh, uh, having this talk, I, I feel so much more confident about that, seeing so many of the talks that have been presented now. Like we're asking the right questions, um, and we have to keep asking them and keep wondering whether our movement is on the right track and whether we're doing the right things. And I think, I think one, uh, this point about what kind of free software is getting written is really important. Uh, I would have said in a talk 10 years ago, 15 years ago, as long as what you're writing is freely licensed, uh, you've done your part. Um, I have to ask you now that that's not, uh, obviously you should write everything you write, I think you should freely license. I, I did say we should stop um, blaming people who use proprietary software. I still think it's okay to blame people who write proprietary software, to be clear. Um, so I think you should license everything you write under a free software license. But really, as Karen was saying about being mindful, be mindful of what you're writing. Is it the top priority? Is it going to give pe more people software freedom in the world? Are you re-implementing for the dozenth time something that already exists three times in free software because your employer wants it faster, better, whatever. Um, obviously, you have to get a job, and if you get a job, make sure it's writing free software. But remember that a lot of the free software that we rely on today, things like GCC, things like core parts of the original Linux code that was written, was written by volunteers, people who didn't get paid to write free software. Uh, most software developers live in a relatively privileged lifestyle. It's just a fact. And there's probably time in your schedule to do a little bit of volunteer work, even if you can't get paid to write the core, most important free software app that's going to liberate people from something proprietary. Maybe you can find an hour or two a week in your schedule to contribute to a project that is doing that. And support each other. You know, I, I think I could never have gotten, I, I've thought about quitting so many times. Like, I, the cause feels so overwhelming, and so many people don't understand why it matters. And there's, I, it's, it's, it's been tough. And, I, and when I've thought about quitting, each of those times, someone in the free software community has materialized and inspired me. And I think we, we, we can be there for each other. I think this is your point, too. Oh, and avoiding proprietary software has ancillary benefits, as I've discovered. So while I'm the like, obnoxious, annoying person in my family who, uh, who you know, is difficult to talk to and uh, who people can't uh, follow my life on Facebook and their, their grandparents and uh, distant relatives are frustrated that they don't know what my children look like anymore. Um, are now starting to come around every time there's a big failure there or, or, a, or a, you know, some data leak or some something. Uh, it, different people in my family hear about it and then I get a phone call saying, oh, did, so that didn't happen to you, huh? Because you, you didn't use Facebook and you didn't, you didn't, you didn't install, like you, didn't, you, don't, you don't have an iPhone, you don't have all these things. And I was like, right. And so it's been really frustrating, but at the same time, uh, not using proprietary software has, uh, has protected me from a lot of the, the bad stuff that's been happening. So I'm with letting you know that we have a um, sadly sometimes sporadic in recent <laughs> times uh, podcast. Uh, so uh, we haven't left a great amount of time for questions as much as we would have liked. Uh, but you can email us in, and we do answer. We do. We don't take real time callers, but if people email us in questions, we do record episodes to answer them and so forth. And of course, we'll be around uh, for the rest of the conference through the end of the day tomorrow uh, to to take questions. Let me slightly that. rephrase that. It would be so awesome if you would give us your questions so we could record a podcast with them. <laughs> And with that, uh, thank you all for listening to us. About thank this. you.